Greetings, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West here, and welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Program. Well, hello, Patriots. Trebo, President, United Patriot Coin. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the story on how a $20 gold coin 100 years ago would buy a gentleman's really nice suit. And at the time we're making this video, gold sitting around $1,912 an ounce would still buy a gentleman's nice suit. But I want to take you back, maybe not that far ago, a time most of you should be able to remember the year 2000. Gold was $275 an ounce, which means if you had invested a million dollars in gold, you would be able to purchase 3,636 ounces of gold. Patriots today, at roughly $1,912 an ounce, that would be worth $6.9 million today. Just another way to encourage you to be your own bank. Stay safe. Be prepared, Patriots. Hey, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Steadfast and Loyal Program. You know, one of the things that we've talked about several times is the Texas is not really the Texas that a lot of people think it is. When you think about some of the failures we've had here in our legislative sessions, when you look at what is going on on our border, uh, there are some big concerns about what type of individuals are calling themselves Republican and going down and to the Texas State House especially. And many of you have contacted me and said, Colonel, what's going on in Texas with them impeaching their own attorney general? Well, we're going to talk about those issues with a person that has decided to once again run for Texas State House, and that's a good friend of mine, Mike Alcott. Mike is a fifth-generation Texan. He was born and raised in Fort Worth, Texas. He received a Bachelor's of Science degree in Biology from Rhodes College, Memphis, Tennessee, and a Ph.D. in Biochemistry from the University of Kentucky in 1994. And being a graduate of the University of Tennessee, I won't hold that against him. After receiving his doctor, he served as a postdoctoral doctoral fellow at Stockholm University in Sweden and Oregon State University, where he conducted cutting-edge cancer research. And during his time, he co-authored or authored nine scientific publications. He and his wife, Marika, are now retired, and in 2012, they moved to Parker County, which is just a little bit west from Fort Worth. And Mike is the co-founder of the Parker County Conservatives, which is an organization that educates, motivates, and activates. And I've had the honor of speaking with them. He served as a Republican precinct chair for seven years as a state Republican executive committee man in Senate District Number 30 from 2015 to 2016. And while on the state Republican executive committee, the SRC, he introduced an election integrity resolution that was narrowly defeated by the establishment wing of the Republican Party. Mike is now a declared candidate once again for Texas State House District Number 60, which he narrowly lost last cycle by just 300 votes. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, sir. So let's talk about, here you are, a, a renowned cancer researcher. I don't but, know if I go that far. Well, the, I have not uh, done nine <laughs> uh, uh, publications in, in cancer research. And, and now you're involved in this arena that is called politics, which is a cancer in and of itself in a way. Yes, sir. What was that moment that, that changed you, that got you want to be interested in the political atmosphere? I think it began right after 9-11. Uh, my wife was actually uh, at a research conference up in New York, and I went with her, and we, uh, I was sitting in the hotel room. I was kind of bored. I went down and got a book. Michelle Malkin uh, wrote a book called mm -hmm. Invasion, and I read that. And I realized just how incompetent the federal government was in stopping illegal immigration. So I became involved in that, started sending faxes and, and phone calls to Congress. And then when my wife uh, 
took a job at the University of Florida. We, um, I drove her from Oregon down to, uh, to Florida, yeah. to Gainesville, Florida. Mm-hmm. That's right. And uh, on the way, uh, we were watching G- uh, Bill O'Reilly one night on Fox News, and there was uh, talk about this, uh, the Minuteman project that was mm-hmm. going to take place in April of 2005. And this was probably the third week of March. And so I d- dropped her off in Florida and then rushed back to uh, um, Tombstone, Arizona, and took a oh, leave of well. absence. Yep, yeah. yep. And um, we had our first meeting there. Tom Tancredo was there, and mm-hmm. a lot of other um, state officials um, uh, that were concerned about the border. And uh, anyway, so we, I spent um, about 25 nights um, in April 2005 there at the border. And um, during that time, I met a lot of uh, retired Marines, um, Army, uh, some former FBI agents. And uh, was called. We were called vigilantes by yeah, former President George W. Bush, which yeah. kind of offended us because you know we thought being a Republican, he'd be concerned about what was happening at the border, and because the border wasn't being closed. But what made it an amazing experience was that what I found um, there were people from all walks of life. There was even a one of the guys that I met down there was a former uh, NASA engineer. He was like the top engineer in the guidance division of the Apollo missions back mm-hmm. in the 1970s, and he was probably in his upper 70s, but. Um, I just, I was just amazed with the, 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 the people, some of them couldn't even barely afford to get down there and they were sleeping in tents on the border for like a whole month. And uh, I met some of the most amazing people in my life. Um, people that just love this country that were willing to sacrifice their time and in some cases, you know, money just to, to get down there. And, and it really just, it changed my life. And I, um, I'd, I'd been in the liberal academic world for quite some time and I knew they, most of them, you know, weren't, you know, they were, they were leftists, um, but we, I shared a common love for science and that's kind of what made it tolerable. Yeah. But after that border watch, I went back uh, to finish some research in Oregon and, and I began to see that contrast is that why do I want to stand, hang around with these people who literally hate capitalism, hate this country and they're trying to destroy it. Um, when I could be around people like this that love this country. And so, um, about a year later, also I, I continued to do like weekend border watches in Arizona and eventually in Texas, um, and I've spent more than 50 nights at the border, um, mostly back in 2005, 2006, and 2007. But I just, um, a lot of people call this like the early Tea Party movement because mm-hmm. the people were just frustrated the federal government wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing and they were willing to sacrifice their time. And, um, but it, you know, up until this point, I had a very strong passion for research, loved, loved research. Um, but I just, when I saw what was happening in the country firsthand at the border, I saw, you know, the, the rape trees, the, yeah. uh, the sometimes like at two in the morning, you see these eight men coming in, you know, uh, all dressed in black, carrying duffel bags. And um, you saw the drugs pouring across um, and the people... Uh, I remember one time in a border watch, and I believe it was October 2007 in uh, uh, the town of Falfurious, um, I spotted 10 nationals, Chinese nationals in, in hiding in the weeds in Doc Vickers Ranch, which was just north of the uh, checkpoint. <clears throat> and one of the differences that I noticed that was happening then that's happening now is that back then everyone was trying to avoid detection by the Border Patrol. Mm-hmm. And now the last few times I've been to the border in the last year and a half, um, they're not trying to avoid. They're literally trying to be found. They're, they mm-hmm. seek out Border Patrol because they know that if they get found by Border Patrol, they're going to get eventually free transportation to wherever they want to go, and usually some some goodies, ATM cards and things like that, maybe even but free there's, phones. But there's still, though, a groups of people that are coming illegally into the country that yes. don't want to be detected. That's correct. And when you That's, go out to West Texas and Big Bend, uh, in Brewster County out there, you know, that's where you find the guys who have, you know, slices of carpeting underneath their shoes so they can't be tracked. When you go back and you think about what you saw then, 2005, and now here we are in 2023, you know, the federal government is mandated to do certain mm-hmm. things by the Constitution. Article 4, Section 4. Absolutely, the Guarantee Clause. And mm-hmm. when they fail to do so, then the states, Article 1, Section 10, Clause mm-hmm. number 3, are able to do something about it when actually invaded, imminent danger, without any admit of delay. What are your concerns about Texas right now not stepping up to the plate? I'm, I'm very disappointed because I'm, I've come to the conclusion that the federal government is never going to secure this border. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. Recall that when President Trump uh, won with the, 
with the mandate to do something about the border. Uh, the first two years he was in office, the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and they the Republicans wouldn't even give money for a border wall. Mm -hmm. So if that's the situation, how do we expect the federal government ever to do something about that? And so because of Article One, Section 10, Clause 3, I think it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's up to Texas to secure it ourselves, and I believe that we have the constitutional authority to do it. And that's something that um, if I get elected, that's going to be my number one priority is to get that implemented and, um, and, and authorize, you know, and I think the governor already has that authority to do it, um, but to get down there and actually use the state guard to arrest, detain, and the most importantly, to deport the illegal aliens. Because until that happens, there are no consequences and people are going to continue to just pour across the border. Yeah, you're absolutely and, right. and you're absolutely right. There, um, I think the vast majority of the illegal aliens that are being funneled through all the cartels are, are actually trying to get caught. But some of the, the, the drug runners and potential terrorists, mm -hmm. I mean, they're not trying, they're, they don't want to get caught. No, by they the don't. So you're absolutely right. That's and, the that's, and that is, it's a huge concern. When I initially got involved in the border, my main concern was terrorists come across the border based on what I read in Michelle Malkin's book. But um, within a few years of that, when I started reading up on the, the consequences of uh, the economical consequences on municipalities, like Falfurius, mm -hmm. the town that I was in, when I got there, they had told me that one of the most things you had to worry about more than anything was snake bites. And he said, if you get bit by a snake a year and a half ago, you could have been taken to the emergency room about you know five miles down the road. Mm -hmm. But if you get bitten now, you got to take a two and a half hour journey to Corpus Christi to get treated. Mm -hmm. And so I feel bad for the the families in a town like Falfurius mm -hmm. that now, because of the consequences of their ER being overrun by people that aren't paying for it, um, they now have, they don't have the care they need. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's overwhelming the schools and it's, I think it's bringing down the quality of the education. Um, I mean, and that's to be expected. I mean, they're not speak, they don't speak English. Most of the, the children aren't speaking English because they're not. Now, you started with your wife, the Parker County Conservative. Yes, sir. When you look at what is going on in our most recent legislative sessions here in Texas, you always hear folks come out afterwards and say, this was the most conservative legislation, legislative session ever. What are your concerns about what is coming out of Austin in these legislative sessions? And for the people to understand, in Texas, it's every other year, and it's a four-month legislative session, basically January to, uh, to about May. Mm -hmm. But there is a delay upon which when they can actually get started presenting bills. What are your top two concerns about the recent legislative sessions we've had here in Texas? Well, I've been disappointed that, you know, like, why wasn't the border bills that are, they're currently talking about, which looks like they're getting ready to die in this special session, why are we in our fourth or third special session mm -hmm. uh, addressing the border. Why wasn't this done back, you know, in February or, or March? Uh, this, the, the Texas Senate passed some really good yeah, bills. Yeah. Um, and then the, the Texas House dragged their feet on HB 20, which was a pretty good border protection bill. And then it died on a point of order. But one of the most disappointing things on that was the fact that uh, we couldn't even find 10 Republicans in the Texas House to sign a petition uh, objecting to the ruling um, by Speaker Dave Feeling that basically said he accepted the point of order. Um, and, of course, he has, I've heard that his parliamentarian actually is a Democrat. Um, but why didn't we get 10 signatures um, on a petition that would actually say, you know what, we don't, we don't concur with that ruling by the parliamentarian, and we want to actually force a vote on this? And then we would have actually had a vote to see really where all these so-called Republicans in the Texas House uh, feel about border security. Property tax relief. Uh, the Texas Senate passed some great bills early on, and you know this all too well being the former GOP chair. Um, Texas House drags her feet, drags her feet, and we end up not even getting, with a $32.7 billion surplus, we couldn't get uh, a good property tax relief bill during the regular session. We had to go to a special session to do that. That's really disappointing. School choice, you know, 85% of Republicans across Texas support school choice. And why didn't it happen during the special session? Why does it the Governor Abbott has to call a special session? And the reason is, is because Dave Phelan in the Texas House, Speaker of the House, Speaker of the House, um, and because of so many of the Republicans in the Texas House just kind of do what he says, he's, and there are, many of them are heavily funded yeah. by them, uh, a, a significant number of the Republicans that voted for impeachment received big donations 
um, from Dave which, Phelan. Which only took 48 hours. That's right. Now, you've got an entire legislative session, and all these priorities can't get passed, but all of a sudden this thing pops up, right. call impeaching the Attorney General, and they get that right. knocked out in 48 so they, hours. So well, they have four or five months to, get, to take a $32.7 billion surplus and give us meaningful, real yeah. property tax relief. They can't get that done in four months, but in 48 hours, they can actually ran through a sham impeachment. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's... it's it's, it's really so let's, sad. let's talk about the person that you're up against. I, I, I never like, you know, really focusing on the opponent because I think it's more important that we hear what you're for sure. than worry about what the other person is against. But what is the biggest issue that you have with the current incumbent here that is bringing you about running again a second time against it? Sure. Um, I think that I, along with most Republican primary voters, are frustrated with Republicans that run as Ronald Reagan and then get elected and go down there and vote like John McCain or Mitt Romney. Or and Donald they, Duck. That's right. Yeah. And then they come back, you know, like right now during election mm-hmm. season and mm-hmm. saying how conservative they are. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and they all seem to be terrified of these scorecards and these or the conservative organizations that actually rate people. Um, uh, in, the, in the case of my opponent, um, in the Rice University uh, study ranking, conservative ranking study done by Mark Jones, a uh, professor, political science professor. Um, he was ranked 65th out of 84 Republicans. Now, is that the document that it you is. have there to count it? It you is. You know, people can kind of get a, an understanding because now what you're showing here is all of the Republicans. Right. The Democrats would, would be down here like the most yeah. conservative Democrat would be here and the most liberal Democrat here. So what we have here is the the 84 Republicans in the Texas House. And up here is the most conservative Republican, and down here is the most liberal Republican, and this is where my opponent is, right here. And if he was actually voting up here with, with the conservative Republicans, I wouldn't be running. Um, but I'm just frustrated with people that vote like this and come up and say, I'm like this. And, um, and this is a non-biased computer analysis. They take all the votes taken by the legislature, put it in a computer, and look for clustering, a tendency to vote with the members of the opposite party. Um, my opponent votes with the Democrats way too often down there, and the impeachment vote is a perfect example. He and, joined- the, and the thing is that you got 84 Republican state representatives out of a body of 150. Yes, sir. But yet, in many times, we see that you know the Speaker of the House, Dave Phelan, is giving committee chairmanships to Democrats. Uh, they are able to come up with points of order like mm-hmm. you just talked about. And it is confirmed the parliamentarian of the Texas State House is a Democrat, Democrat. Mm-hmm. that worked in a previous uh, a Democrat administration. What level of frustration are you getting when you go out there and knock on people's doors or when you talk to people or when you have your Parker County yes. conservative meeting? Well, obviously, most the main reason most of the people that come to our meetings and the why we're having an average attendance of more than 230 people in meeting now is that people are frustrated. They're, 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 they don't feel like the Republicans are fighting for them, but they're tired of being lied to. Um, they don't understand why with the, the Republicans you know, in Texas control the House, the Senate, and the governorship. Why is it so difficult to get significant property tax relief? Why is it, why is it so hard to get the border secure? School choice is, is popular even among Democrats. Mm-hmm. And so why is it so hard to get the will of the voters done? Why is it that the eight legislative priorities of the Republican Party of Texas are routinely and consistently ignored by the Speaker of the Texas House and by the members that actually serve him and not us? Yeah. And I think, um, I think voters truly are missing, they, they want people to go down there and actually represent them and not the lobbyists and not the Speaker of the Texas House. And right now, you know, I, I, I almost can count on one hand the people down there that are truly down there fighting for what the voters want. You know, one of the most frustrating things I saw coming out of this last legislative session was that we know that China is our number one geopolitical threat. And we know that there is a former member of the Chinese People's Liberation Army that has bought a huge swath of land right next to uh, Laughlin Air Base, which mm-hmm. is down there on De- in Del Rio, Texas, mm-hmm. which just happens to sit right there on the border. But yet in our own legislature, in the Texas State House, they could not pass mm-hmm. legislation. They said we will not allow China or foreign adversarial right. entities to buy land in the state of Texas. That's right. Senator Colcars in the Senate had mm-hmm. a bill, yes. and it passed very quickly out of the Texas Senate, and it got to the House, and nothing... It died in the Texas House. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, and how, how can that be? How, I, I mean, most Americans 
Maybe a few years ago they didn't recognize the danger from China, but I think today they do. And, and they expect, that's a simple bill that should easily pass the Texas House. Why doesn't it pass in the Texas House? And people are, voters are frustrated with that. And like I said, that's one reason why our attendance at our Parker County Conservative meetings are, are just going through the roof, because people, they're, they're waking up, they're getting engaged, and they're frustrated. They just don't feel like they have people in Austin or D.C. Mm -hmm. fighting for them and representing them. And the, the, you know, the lobbyists control both places. And, and, and it's just it's a shame. I mean, it's, we, we need to get back to the idea of what a representative is. You know, if you get elected to the Texas House, you are a state representative. You're supposed to be representing the voters in your district. You're not supposed to be representing the Speaker of the Texas House. You're not supposed to be representing the lobbyists that help grease your palms to get you there. You're supposed to be, you know. And that's one reason I've never taken a single penny of lobby or PAC money, yeah. ever. And I'm not going to. So 300 votes short in the last cycle. Yes, sir. How do you make up those 300? Um, I'm continuing to, to meet voters left and right. Um, I, there's a, a great group of uh, conservatives out in Palo Pinto County that were not even active two years ago that uh, have formed a sister group to ours, Parker County mm -hmm. Conservatives, and they are out educating voters as we speak in Palo Pinto County. And um, they are meeting lots of people that um, are waking up to the voting record of Glenn Rogers. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, uh, the message is getting out. I know that um, Representative Rogers' vote to impeach Paxson is not helping him right now. And I think the voters were very upset about that. And the ones that actually watched the trial realized there was no evidence. Regardless of what you think of Attorney General Ken Paxson, yeah. Uh, and everyone, the media is still today actually putting out articles saying that he was acquitted, but then they continued to, to write all the charges. Well, the, all those charges, when it came up to the Senate, there was no evidence for any of those yeah. charges. So regardless of whether you like him or not, uh, that was a complete sham impeachment. And any, elect, any Republican, and for that matter, Democrat, in the Texas House that actually voted to impeach Attorney General Paxson without seeing any evidence, mm -hmm. um, they're going to pay a political price. And from what I understand of the 60 Republicans that joined the, all the 61 Democrats. 61 Democrats. Yeah, 60, 61 six, Democrats 60, 60, 60, Republicans. Yeah, 60 Republicans, 61 Democrats. 23 Republicans yeah. said this is ridiculous. But what, what it told me, that vote, what it really, the most inf in, informative thing about that was that only 23 Republicans in the Texas House had the courage and the backbone to stand up to Speaker Dade Phelan. Yeah. Everyone in that chamber knew that Dade Phelan wanted that impeachment to happen. Yeah. And so that was a speaker vote. And, you know, God bless the, the 23 Republicans that did what was right. Um, and um, like I said, those, those 60 Republicans that joined the 61 Democrats are, uh, I'm sure when they saw that a, a acquittal came, they're panicking. And they are panicking. And, they should. and you can tell they should be, yeah. They should be. Yep. The, voters, the voters know it, and they're, and they're going to they're gonna be remembering that. Last question. I'm yes, gonna, sir. I'm going to ask you. You're not going to answer to me. You're going to answer to the camera. Why should people, not just in the state of Texas or not just in House District 60, but why should people outside the state of Texas be concerned about what's happening in the Texas State House? Because if, if we don't get our act together, and if Texas goes blue... If we don't do something about the border, um, then we're going to lose our country. And I think everyone in and around this country is recognizing the fact that Texas is, leads, this, leads the conservative movement and we need to do something about it. And we can't, we can't uh, have the Democrats running the Texas House because that's the, the, been the major roadblock for getting conservative bills passed in, in Texas. So goes Texas. So goes the nation, right. people. And when you look at what is starting to happen here in the state of Texas, you have to be very, very concerned. So, Mike Olcott, I want to thank you. And without a doubt, you have my steadfast and loyal endorsement and support. Thank you, sir. Oh, you know yeah. that. <laughs> okay. But, again, get out there and educate and inform the people. And uh, make sure your message gets out beyond that House district because Texas is important for the future and the legacy of this constitutional yes, republic. So thank God bless you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for, for taking the time to be with us here. At thank you for the invitation, program. sir. Too thank easy. you so much. And thank uh, you for everything you're doing for the oh, conservative movement. I'm just a regular old guy. <laughs> Take you, Mike. Thank you. Before they burn it down.